Welcome, everybody, to The Three Gun Show. I'm your host, Dave Hartman, and today with me is Ryan Kleckner of the Going Ballistic Podcast. Ryan, how you doing? I'm doing great. Now that I'm on your show, Dave. Thanks for having me here. Man, I am so pumped to have you. So first off, the uh, the Going Ballistic Podcast uh, yeah. is... <laughs> I, I like that you uh, you feel bad about the term going ballistic and you talk about it on the podcast. Like for I, me, I, that uh, was actually right what I was going to say, believe it or not. I'm glad you listened because I, <laughs> I was like, I shouldn't have called it going ballistic, but oh well. Well, I think it's hilarious because for me, like I, I looked at it as a, a shooting term, right? I didn't even right. think of like you would be, you know, on there ranting and raving and stuff like that. And <laughs> I didn't notice it until you called it out in the in the actual podcast, which I thought was kind of funny. Yeah, well, um, I, I, I can pick on myself. I thought it was a cute name, and so sometimes I catch myself trying to be too cute on something, and you know, you know what? Probably just would have been easier to be the shooting show or the Ryan Collector pot, something, because it's really, it's morphed into, you know, me and my friends or me and my cousin on there just kind of hanging out with the Kleckners talking about shooting, you know, and I think the style that people have liked better has been just like they're hanging out in the garage with us talking about guns. A little yeah. weird for me, but... I'll keep doing it. <laughs> yeah. And I think that's what uh, people identify with. Um, you know, before we got going here, you mentioned that the, uh, the podcast is an interesting medium because it's intimate because you're in people's ears, literally uh, in their earbuds and uh, they make that connection with you. So, you know, I don't, I don't know about you, but I've, I've done this for like three, three years, 200 and some podcasts and I'll have people come up with me at the range and, you know, they'll pick up a conversation where they left off when they got out of the truck to go to the match, you know? So it's, oh, uh, wow, that's interesting. Yeah, it's it's it is kind of funny because like I don't have a context for it sometimes. Like I think I recorded that like seven weeks ago, man. I don't know what you're talking about. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I, I think people feel they can get your personality better too. I mean, I know video is great. We're here on YouTube doing this, but yeah, there's just something about being part of someone's life, whether it's in their vehicle or mowing the lawn or they're working in the garage. That it, it's a great way for people to reach out and touch their customers too. I, I really encourage it for anyone. Podcasting is ironically the new medium even though it's going backwards kind of the old radio so yeah, that's cool. <laughs> yeah. yeah and it is and uh you know for me like the the morning zoo talk radio i never really connected with very well um uh -huh. so like i eschewed that but the long form you know where you can get to know people and and get to know their their past their present where they come from and their opinions and stuff like that is something that i really enjoy did you just say eschewed I think I did. Did I use that, it correctly? That, that's, that's, you did. That's like a one dollar word, man. <laughs> one I, of my I, one of my more popular phrases I like to say or to write on people's papers because I, I teach also. I do like too many things, and every once in a while I'll write a shoe obfuscation, which means <laughs> avoid making things complicated, which is essentially what yeah. shoe obf obfuscation does. Yeah, yeah, and uh I totally got that. That's hilarious. I'm gonna be using that from now on. Thank you. You're welcome. Um so Ryan. I want to want to tell you a quick story here. So I was on the way to a uh, a match, the Vortex Shooter Source Three Gun uh, Championships mm -hmm. in uh, in Texas, just outside of Fort Worth, with a few buddies. And one of my friends, uh, Josh Huff, said, "Well, you, I've been listening to this new podcast, and you got to listen to it." And uh, I was like, "Okay, well, what is it?" Because I, I honestly I listen to a lot of podcasts, and I don't have time for a new one. But he said it's uh it's going ballistic with Ryan Kleckner. And uh, I, I was like, God, Kleckner sounds familiar. I don't, I don't know why, but I'm pretty sure it sounds familiar. And I'll, all right, I'll give it, a, I'll give it a chance. So when I got back, I wrote it down. When I got back to uh, to the house after um, you know the match and everything, I googled your name, and I realized, oh, I've uh, I've watched several YouTube videos. One where you were explaining um, Mill versus uh, MOA. Mm -hmm. um, several things you did with the NSSF and I'm like, Oh, okay. That's, that's why I got it. And then as soon as I, um, popped on the uh, podcast, I you know heard your voice. I'm like, yep, that's right. Cause you have oh, a very, thanks, man. <laughs> you have a very distinctive voice, but, um, again, I don't have time to consume a lot of podcast content. And after your first two episodes, I listened to the next 15. So I listened to like 17 episodes in a row. I started at the beginning and wow, like, that's the best compliment someone could give. That's awesome, man. I appreciate it. <laughs> So, yeah, you're welcome. So for the for the audience listening, for the Three Gun Show listeners, like this this is why Ryan's on here because the the information is so incredible that Ryan puts out, and uh, pumped to have you here on today, uh, sharing I it with the it. Show audience. I hope what we what we do today when we get into stuff is uh, first off, thank you again. That's a great compliment. But second, I, I hope what you're getting that's valuable out of the information I try to share 
is that it's not that hard. Yeah. And I think there's so many people that just want to protect their part of the industry, their little niche and be like, Oh, I'm a long range shooter and it's super tough and not everybody can do it. And therefore I'm cool. That's BS. It's, it's not really that difficult. You know, I mean, yeah, when we get to the extreme levels of it, maybe you need to start worrying about how the earth is rotating, but I bet that you don't need to worry about it in three gun. <laughs> and I bet you don't need to worry about it for the like 99% of the long range shooting that's going on out there, even at distance. So it's like, instead of trying to impress each other with factoids and, and doing what I call playing stump the chump, you know, and quizzing people on things and trying to one up someone else is maybe we should open the sport up more and get people into the fundamentals of it and get people into enjoying it. And yeah, it's, it's not that bad. Yeah. And I think that's why, uh, why I really connected with it, Ryan is that, um, you know, you put, you put things in such a, a simple and easy to understand manner. You, you, you bring out like a, a, um, a complex concept and then you break it down to where it makes it, you know, easy for like the lay person to understand or, you know, beginner to intermediate whatsoever. Um, and so, when, when you said on the podcast, you know, oh, by the way, if you need legal help, contact me. I'm a lawyer as well. I was like, well, this isn't adding up. So let's uh, <laughs> let's take her back a little bit here and uh, talk about your background. Because you have, once I did a little bit of research, you have like a super interesting background that you kind of, uh, you know, let fall out over the the 25 or so first podcast that you've done. But uh, but I think it's super interesting and something the audience can, uh, can really connect with here. Okay. Um, well... Grew up, born and raised in Arizona, so spent a lot of time out hiking through, believe it or not, we have trees there in northern Arizona and mountains and hunting, and uh, the best thing for me is elk hunting in northern Arizona with a bow. Even though I'm a gun guy, I love bow hunting. Uh, it's kind of what our family looked forward to. I had a great family out there. There's not many Kleckners. If there's a Kleckner, chances are I'm, I'm directly related to them. <laughs> Uh, left for the military, never really expected to go into the military. It was just kind of one of those whim things I decided to do. And uh, went with a contract to be able to try out to get into first range battalion and ended up making it there after a series of schools and things you got to do and had an amazing but tough time. I mean, I was I was by no means the the uh, the best of really kind of anything. I was surrounded <laughs> by just amazing, amazing guys. I was just lucky to be around, you know, and it was I never had to try so hard to be mediocre. That's, that's true. <laughs> I mean, we, there were guys that you'd go running with in the morning that they would run their 10 miler in under an hour, right? So they would do sub six minute miles for 10 in a row. Damn. That's just what they did. And I'm six, two and two thirty, and I'm just not going to run that fast. Right. So, uh, I had to train extra, 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 extra just to be in the middle of the pack. And I kind of like that. And I, I have no uh, humility in admitting that that's just how great a people it was to be in, to be so young and to be in a special operations community. Um, that was actually one of the things they tried to get you to quit, by the way, when I used to, the school you used to have to go through or the process used to be called RIP, the Ranger Indoctrination Program, mm -hmm. where you could only quit. You couldn't be failed out. So they just made it more and more miserable until enough people quit. And one of the speeches they gave us that was the closest to convincing me, I still didn't quit, but it was the closest <laughs> to convincing me was, why would you do this to yourself? Why not go to some other unit and be the stud? Why would you want to go somewhere where you have to fight to be in the middle of the pack? Oh man, like, that's some uh, mind that's trickery a good there. Point. They're like, go somewhere else. You'll be the hero. You'll get promoted first. You'll get all the cool schools. You'll do this. You'll, you know, and I'm like, man, that, that is some good mind trickery. But anyway, so I, I uh, <laughs> deployed to Afghanistan a couple of times, ended up making it over to the sniper section in the Ranger Battalion. Uh, went to Afghanistan the first time at the end of 2001 uh, as a sniper, as a shooter. And then the second deployment, I went as a spotter because the spotter is the senior guy on our teams. And shortly after that, Iraq was starting up and I got out. I had my chance to get out and said, I'm leaving while the party's still fun. I went back to Phoenix, went to college. Is that, I'm sorry uh, to interrupt. Is that first Iraq or second one there? First, well, I guess the second one. So 2003. Oh, 2003. Okay. I missed the so, date there. Yeah. So Afghanistan, 2001, Afghanistan again, 2002. And then right in Iraq was starting up 2003. I was like, I'm going back to college. Party's fun. Take care. <laughs> Uh, I love the military. Uh, I just, I'm a big believer that uh, you should either make a career out of it or not. I think everyone should go do at least one enlistment. I think it's amazing. It was, it was amazing for me. But once you're done with that first enlistment, you have a hard decision to make. You know, I was not four years behind my peers. 
I was four years later than them starting college, but mm -hmm. I was ahead of them in so many other ways because of the experiences the military gave me. But I just knew I didn't want to make it a career. So I went back to college. I taught uh, at a community college out there all the outdoor education classes, like backpacking, rock climbing, land navigation. It was really fun. I also taught at a government contracted sniper school for a while out there. And then when I graduated with my bachelor's degree, I got bored again and wanted my next challenge in life. And again, on a whim, uh, went to law school, moved across the country to Connecticut, went to law school, uh, just law freshly school married. Like one of the most uh, highly committed whims you could possibly do, right? Yeah, I'd say second to going to a Ranger Battalion, but yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, so I did that one, and my wife, uh, we like I said, we just got married, and she's with me. She's like, you know what? Let's do it. Screw it. Let's, let's go move across the country and do that. So we did, law, did that, and my first summer, I got an internship at the National Shooting Sports Foundation. They're the folks that uh, run and operate the SHOT Show. They're the ones I did the videos with, and it was actually... We have a video studio there. And one of the guys came to me while I was working on government relations stuff, you know, the legal stuff. He said, hey, you got a shooting background, right? You want to come do an explainer video? Ah, sure. So I went down there. I did the video on how to mount your scope. And we never expected it would take off. But a couple million views later, we're like, okay, maybe we should do some more videos. Yeah. And we just started knocking out some more videos. Uh, I worked there for a couple of years and then ended up going to Remington uh, where I worked there out of the New York City office, believe it or not, out of Manhattan, and traveled all over the country as we acquired companies. And four and change years with Remington, ended up being a vice president at Remington Outdoor Company um, over compliance and security and things like that. And then left Remington to hang out my own shingles and attorney in firearms compliance and laws. And I decided, you know what? I've always wanted to write a book. Uh, even if only my mom and my best friend bought a copy, I think it'd be cool to say that I wrote a book. So the feedback from those NSSF videos, that first group of videos we did was always what you said was, man, thanks for explaining it simply. Thanks for making it not you know too hard to figure out and understand and opening this up. And I love it. I said, you know what? Maybe that's my brand. Maybe my brand is making it simple. So I decided to write a beginner's guide to long range shooting. I call it the long range shooting handbook. It's just got a bright orange cover because I wanted people to take it to the range and find it in their range bag. I published that. It's been a little over two years now, so probably 28 months, something like that, 27, 28 months ago now. Mm -hmm. And I cannot believe, not false humility, cannot believe how much it took off. Uh, it's sold 65,000 copies so far. Damn. It's still <laughs> the number incredible. one bestseller in its category. So two and a half years later, if you look on Amazon, it's still the number one shooting book for that long. It's just insane. I would have taken better pictures had I known... <laughs> <laughs> every picture in that book was taken on my iPhone. I kid you not. I pulled my iPhone out of my pocket and took pictures of like a bullet or took pictures of a bolt or okay. took pictures of pictures with my iPhone. So every picture in the book was taken with an iPhone, just wrote it myself, uh, published it myself. I reached out to a couple of publishers and they're like, no, we're not interested. And then like two months later, they all came running back. I'm like, no, forget you. I published it myself. I like it now. That's awesome. Yeah, so I decided, well, writing and doing media and teaching and doing this stuff was way more fun than being a lawyer. So I'm just going to back off being a lawyer to a very little. Uh, I run some online training courses like at Rocket FFL. Mm -hmm. uh, I have a training course for people to get their federal firearms license to be a gun dealer or something like that. That has taken off more than I could expect. It's just been, I've been very blessed. It's, it's been nice to have that going. And then uh, I just released a children's safety book last week called Firearm Safety is No Accident. Um, so that's on Amazon now too and selling. That's, do, that's, that's really fun to do. That's not really a moneymaker. That's just a... I want to get that out there to make things safer. Right. And then I just started a company six, seven months ago, another one, because I don't have enough to do, uh, <laughs> called, oh, and I teach. So I teach constitutional law at the University of Alabama in Huntsville. I drive down there to do that. Semester starting up again next week. Um, I started a company called Mayday Safety, and it was because my, my neighbor and I were actually sitting around at night realizing, around the campfire, talking about how we have a problem with these either shootings or bombings or things that are going on and people don't know how to handle the chaos and confusion. Mm -hmm. And we talked about, I said, you know, I figured out this kind of online training thing and a little bit of, you know, SEO. So people are finding the site and taking online training. So we need to do online training because there's no reason that the secretary at the front of an office building doesn't know how to use a tourniquet because she's going to be the one saving a life with that tourniquet, not the AED, the external defibrillator on the wall that right. every office building has. That's not going to be helping anybody, and that's expensive. 
but a little cheap tourniquet that someone could not even super proper training, just a little bit of training could use will literally save lives before first responders get there. I said, you know what? We should do, you know, safety training for organizations. That's kind of like the military mindset to it. And then I, I, as we're, we drinking whiskey and solving the world's problems, <laughs> I brought up the idea of, well, then you could have an app and then you could check in on who was safe and who wasn't. Cause then, you know, sometimes knowing who doesn't need help is just as important as knowing who does. And my neighbor went, that's it. The app, we should do it. And we, oh yeah, whatever. The next day, the Texas tr- shooting happened at the end of last year. Mm-hmm. You know, I texted each other and said, were you serious? He's like, well, I don't know. Were you serious? I said, I, I think I was serious. Let's do this. And here we are today. We, I'm in my office now. We have a, a, a real company and uh, the Mayday safety app is out there in iTunes. It, we just got done beta testing the Android version. So it'll be out in a couple of days and schools and businesses are just signing up everywhere and has turned in seven months now into this essentially a blue force tracker from the military where schools and businesses can see this really cool aerial view of their facility. And then if there's an emergency, they can see exactly where the person is and then they can see who checks in safe. So teachers can lock down and first responders can know which classrooms to go to and they can communicate. And it just took off on us, man. Wow. Okay. So that, you said a lot right there. I don't, I don't think you took a breath, but that... Uh, <laughs> Sorry, man. No, I'm totally teasing. That Mayday safety app, that is an incredible idea. When when you said like the uh, the Blue Force tracker, like that that makes yeah. a ton of sense, especially when you're talking about like, you know, hundreds of students, dozens of teachers in a, in a place or like in an office building. Yeah, so you can't see it very well in the camera maybe, but there it is for people that are watching live. It's just a, a smartphone app that anyone can hit and trigger even the black see how we did a black background Uh uh-huh to it it's actually a very lightly faded map you can see the google map back there you can add your family in there see there's a bunch of family people members and i can check if they're safe so right now to my wife i can just send her a safety check and no matter where she's at in her phone this notification pops up hey are you safe she can say yes or no and i can get the feedback right away and it works worldwide so i had this in south africa two weeks ago we've had people in jordan testing it and just for fun they'll be standing on a street corner in Jordan and be like, all right, Ryan, I'm going to fire one off. And they hit the Mayday button and right on my screen is exactly where they're standing. And it's blowing people's minds because they're, they realize that they'd have no other recourse in Jordan. There's no 911. Right. Who would they call? How would they even you know, pronounce the street name that they're on to try and describe where they're at? You know, so it's really turned into something bigger than we ever expected. And we're happy. Man, honestly, I did not know that you were doing that, but that is like one of the coolest things I've I've heard Thanks, of in, uh, in recent times. What an intelligent app! Like, oh, the black screen I mentioned. It's because some other software solutions are that are kind of similar but do stuff different. They have white screens, mm-hmm. and it takes the military. So you, who Kyle Lamb is of Viking Tactics, yes. mm-hmm. this is he and I are doing this together. Oh, cool! So this is Kyle Lamb, me, and our business partner. It's the three of us. Uh, we're like, no, we need a black screen because you don't want someone hiding in the dark and illuminating their face. Yeah, exactly. You know, just simple things like that that we're hoping that the special operations experience changes for schools. Huh. Okay. Well, so that's cool. It's bringing like the, uh, you know, several experiences that you have in your lifetime and, and applying them to something that's like, uh, you know, super important to, you know, not only the, the, uh, the country, but yourself as well, because you're a father, right? Exactly right. And that's why I did the fire and safety book too. Both of these are because of my kids is my daughter came home from school taught rattling off pool safety and fire safety. And that's when it hit me. They'll refuse to talk about firearms in school. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. So, let's fix that. Let's make a fire and safety book. And then we're thinking about the kids at school. I'm like, they, they don't know what they're doing. It takes 20 minutes for the first responders to get there. What's going on in those 20 minutes, you know, in Parkland, They had no idea whether to get in the classroom or out of the classroom, no way to get the message out to people, no way to get feedback, you know, back upstream. So Parkland happened while we were making this. And it actually is a weird feeling to not only be punched in the gut to know that Parkland happened, Mm -hmm. but to be punched in the gut that knowing that you have a tool that can maybe save lives and you're not done yet. Yeah. So it's changed it to now I hear of a school shooting and it's like, oh, I was so close to being done or how come you guys didn't use this yet? Huh. So we hope it helps. So what what is the... uh, what I'm sorry, I'm really in, interested by this. We'll, I oh, promise I the it. audience we'll talk about firearms in a minute here. But what, what <laughs> well, is, for everyone yeah. for firearms, the reason you should like May Day is one, it's free for families and everybody around the world. The mm-hmm. other reason you should like it is everyone wants to have the debate about guns, which I think we should have. But I'm tired of people saying, no, don't ban guns. It'll do nothing to help. 
and then not saying what will. Uh, yeah. This is a chance for you to have the debate about guns and going, you know what might help? Here. So instead mm. of just saying no to everything, here's something to say yes to. Sorry, go ahead. Well, so that actually answered the uh, question I had is like, what's your strategy for spreading this app to, um, you know, to businesses, to schools and stuff like that? Because like you said, I think people are willing to talk about tornado drills, earthquake drills, fire drills, Tyrannosaurus drills, but they don't want to talk about, uh, you know, the, an active shooter sort of thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, one is the fact we don't know if this is right or not. We, I've never done software before. This is, I jumped feet first into a software company. And our plan is that if we give it for free to everybody so they can use it for their families, so that if your wife is across the country and she has a, an a alert, she hits the button that right on your phone, you see an exact pin of where she's standing at and where she needs help, that people are going to go, all right, there's some utility there. Or heaven forbid a, a mass shooting happens at a shopping mall and you're at the other end of the mall and you get the alert that something's happening nearby. We're hoping that will get people excited enough and save enough lives that they will then push it up to their businesses and their churches and their schools. And now the businesses and churches and schools pay for it. And that's how we're hoping to monetize it. So it's like, it's the balance of, we hope it goes viral, but not so viral that it makes us go broke. Right? Before, <laughs> the, before businesses, you know, enough of them pay for it. Schools we're doing as cheap as we can get. It's a thousand bucks for the year. And the school is covered for all the parents and students and everything like that. So, yeah. Yeah, that's like dirt cheap for the value there. Yeah, everyone tells I, us we should charge more. And we're like, you know what? I'll charge a business more. But yeah, I can't I, say I'm in it to keep kids safe if I'm you know, more worried about the profit for the schools. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, I'm totally uh, contacting my family after this and making them all get Thanks, the man. app. I think that's an awesome idea. I love it. So Ryan, that's not not even something I knew that you were doing, but the uh, let's let's talk about the uh, the children's book that you just uh, sure. launched here. Sure. So uh, obviously, <laughs> there's a hole in the market. Like you said, we uh, we teach about uh, fire safety and pool safety, mm -hmm. but not firearm safety. So how how do you write to to that age group? Is is it difficult? I have, it I have no idea. Very difficult. It's it's embarrassing too because it's a little vulnerable in a weird way. Yeah. You know, I write the handbook. I can throw it down on the table and be like, "That's the truth." You could not agree with it. You could call me stupid, but you're not going to dissuade me. I know what I wrote in there is what I believe. Mm -hmm. Writing mm -hmm. fiction is a little harder, you know. Uh, one quick point. I, I, I'm sorry to do this, but I want to do a tie from May Day to the to the gap in there. Sure. How to sell it on businesses was what you asked about. You know, mass shootings. Is this is actually easier to sell because of the fire alarms, because of things like that? Mm -hmm. Is businesses were were teaching us. You go to a 2,000 employee business. And they say, do you know how long it takes for us to make sure that everyone's out of the building during a fire alarm? Yeah. And like, so we could just have everyone, you could just send out a message saying, are you in the parking lot? Yes or no. And they see the entire screen just all turn green lights and they only need to go look for Mary Jane who's stuck under the, in the building. That's blowing their minds. And we're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's great for active shooters. And they're just, sure. Great, Ryan. We yeah. just like it for communication. But anyway, so the gap in the market for the safety. Um, Hang on real quick. I want to follow up with that one. So right. uh, I used to work at a uh, large aerospace company and we had, you know, fire drills. We all had to meet in the parking lot. And so we stand there and watch the thing burn with all these uh, chemicals and stuff inside and huffing the air. Right. So uh, we always thought that was dumb. And then anytime the uh, fire alarm went off, we'd jump in the car and we'd go get breakfast. So uh, yeah, why not? Yeah. But now we're three missing people. Right. Correct. So, <laughs> but so, not, so uh, if that company uses Mayday. You check in safe and bolt. And now they have a green dot next to you. You're good to yeah. go. They're they know they don't need to look for you. Burritos. They're totally fine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the yeah. problem with the book is I wanted to do firearm safety. And my first chapter of the Long Range Shooting Handbook is called Firearm Safety. And that's all it does is just talk about the four basic rules. Mm -hmm. I even say, if you don't agree with these, no problem. Just give the book to somebody else. Um, oh, that's so a good idea. The problem with kids' firearm safety is my kids know when they're being sold to. So when you read a kid a book and it's got an obvious agenda... It's obvious to the kid. Yeah. They yeah. get it too. And you who dictates what titles or what books to read to my kids is my kids. I mean, of course, I can force them to sit down and read a book. I'm in charge. But when I want to read them a bedtime story, I want to ask them, what story do you want to hear? So I thought, I, how do I get the fire and safety message to kids where I sneak it in at the end? That was one. And the other is, how do I appeal to the non gun community? So I think people one. that are right. So people that are the least informed about guns, I think, are the most unsafe. I don't know if that's true. Maybe 
maybe the people that think they know about guns but don't might be more unsafe. But either way, they yeah. need to hear this message too. So I didn't want to make it, Timmy the AR-15 teaches about gun safety. <laughs> that's not, right? That's not going to appeal to anybody or it's not going to help, I don't think. So instead I wrote a really cheesy parent to kid. I love yous on like every page. And uh, I have a couple of kids that share stories of how they've had accidents in their lives. You know, one of them, they spilled the flower. One of them bent a nail helping build the doghouse. And the message in each little scenario from the parent is always, oh, it's okay. Accidents happen, but don't worry. I still love you. And at the end of the book, uh, grandpa, I even made it grandpa leaves a gun out because I wanted these anti-gun families to think, well, what if I don't have guns in my home, right? Right. So yeah. the kids at grandpa's house sees the gun laying out, runs over to play with it, and then grandpa flips out on them. And the kid says, well, wait a minute. How come you freaked out so much about the gun but not about the other accident? And the message is, you know, things can break and bend and things can be mended, but you're not a thing. You know, an accident happening with you is, is, is you can't fix that. And so... Yeah, I, ho I hope it works, but it is. It's a little weird to write "I love you" on every page and put your name on the book. <laughs> yeah, especially <laughs> laughed at. Yeah, especially from uh, like our industry, right? Where we like to say we have a you know ton of Type A personalities. I like to joke that A stands for a hole sometimes. Yeah. But the uh, you know the other thing is like you're you know Ranger combat veteran, so you've got a you've got a little bit of an image to uphold here. And when you go writing kids books, maybe uh, maybe that loses a little street cred. What do you think? Yeah, maybe bring it. I'll, I'll happily, <laughs> I'll happily lose street kid to have, you know, parents, uh, cause the best of the books really for parents, by the way. I mean, I make it a kid's yeah. book, but the kids aren't the ones that really need the gun safety message. It's the parents that are in, are in charge of leaving the gun out or not, you know, or, or saying, I even put a message in the back to parents. I essentially admonish people that give the excuse. Oh, don't worry. It's unloaded. Or things like that. No, there's yeah. no excuse. Yeah, I think a firearm should be under an adult's direct control or locked away from kids. I think those are the only two options if you got kids around. But mm -hmm. well, it's a it's a great message that uh, that you're putting out there and something useful that people can actually use and then uh, learn from it in entertaining ways. So it's great, Thanks, man. man. Uh, one thing that I've noticed, Ryan, is that you know I I don't personally have kids. I've got two uh, two nephews that you know teenager and almost teenager right now. Uh, one is like, just like nuts about guns and watches everything on YouTube. I keep trying to steer him to your channel, but you don't blow enough shit up for him to be interested. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, my videos probably aren't that exciting for, for, for kids. teenagers. Yeah. I've, I've won. I've won cool one shooting the bear at standing. That's a cool video. Yeah. That's a cool video. All right. I'll send him that one next. But anyway, so the, uh, the point I'm trying to make is that, uh, in three gun, we have a lot of, uh, junior shooters and I, I wouldn't <laughs> say like, you know, a lot proportionally, but, um, definitely more than you would expect. Right. Yeah. And I find that the maturity of the young people that I shoot with at these matches is way higher than someone else that I would encounter in, in like a normal way. And I think that it's because the, um, the responsibility that we place upon them by being responsible for something very dangerous if used incorrectly. Mm -hmm. I think you're right. I, I, I've met countless kids out at three gun matches and think to myself, wow, what a, what a great American. Like, yeah, kids, seriously. Kids right. hey, you, you can't have a kid that most kids that are bad are kids that don't listen. Yep. Right. Yeah, absolutely. And if they don't listen, they can't be out of the three gun match. So I think it's a self-selecting population, but I agree with you. Uh, you know, that does make sense too. Like maybe they started out at a higher level and uh, they're only going higher because of the additional responsibilities they're given. Yeah. I mean, like I said, most kids that you look at a kid and you think, well, that kid's misbehaving. They're usually misbehaving and not listening to instructions somehow from the right. parent or something else. So anyway, I, I love it. I think I think more kids should get into shooting. I think three guns such a fun way for them to do it because it's so fun of an environment. Yeah. You know, every match is fun and it's very rare to find the a-hole out there. They are, there are some, but most people are happy to let you try their equipment or help you with stages or things like that. And, you know, you could have the kid out being active doing a sport and the parent just sitting there the entire time or vice versa, or you can have a sport where you can walk around and do it together. I think it's great. Yeah. And I've seen it all different ways too. And, you know, especially in the last couple months here and some of the matches I've traveled to, I've seen the, uh, you know, the parents out supporting the junior, um, in like, you know, I don't shoot, but my, but my child does. And so I'm here supporting them. I've seen the juniors out, you know, kicking sand and kicking rocks while dad shooting. And then, uh, the combinations, uh, too. So it's cool that, you know, it, any way you guys want to do it, you know, it's welcome in, in the sport. Agreed. Agreed. 
So Ryan, let's uh let's uh switch books here. Long range shooting handbook. The All right. <laughs> the uh the content that we get on the podcast, a lot of times you're like, okay, well, this is in chapter so and so of the book, so go refer back to that. Can I listen to all 54 episodes or whatever it is of your podcast and get the whole gist, or do I need to buy the book and uh and uh learn along there as well? You can get the gist. That's how much I'm not trying to sell things above anything else. Uh sure. you could definitely get the gist. The reason the book it was formatted the way it is, though, is it's meant to be a reference manual. Okay. So I like that. I think you could finish the book faster than you could listen to all my podcasts. Right. I gotcha. You could, you couldn't listen to all my podcasts in one day and you could finish the book in a day if you really wanted to sit down and and tear through it. Um, I mean, it's a substantial enough book, but you you get my point. The other thing is I break the book down into what it is, how it works and how to use it. So I spend the whole first third of the book, just the real basics. And I know a lot of people out there think that they're too cool for that. But mm-hmm. it, go look at some of the reviews. Go look at some of the people that have endorsed it. Most of the comments they'll say are, I mean, Kyle, I was on Kyle's podcast, and he said there's only one thing you got to change on this book, Ryan. You got to take the word beginner off of it. Because he admitted to learning stuff in there. He fully on his podcast was like, hey, I thought this was the truth, and you said the other way, and I had to go look it up. And he's like, it, you're right. That's so cool. <laughs> Is If people leave their ego at the door and are willing to read a book that has the word beginner on it, even in the beginning when it's like, here's what an ogive is. Here's what a cannula is. This is what it does. Here's this part of the cartridge. Maybe that's boring to you. Maybe you mm-hmm. already know that. But I, I can't know what all my readers know. So I want to get everyone on the same platform before we get into the middle section of the book, You know, which is how it works. Okay, now we're going to talk about what a minute of angle is, but not a Wikipedia article on what a minute of angle is. More of a how to use it in the real world. Here's the tips and tricks I use. You know, here's... Here's the difference between a meter and a yard, and here's my mnemonic for remembering the difference of which number you know is going to be bigger than the other number. Well, meters are bigger, but the number of meters to a target is going to be smaller because there's fewer of the bigger ones. Well, that can confuse people. So I say, well, here's how you can really think about it and really know it, or you could ignore all that and just use this little mnemonic trick, which is I look at the alphabet. And M is in the middle of the alphabet, and Y is at the ends for meters to yards. If right. I want to go from meters to yards, I have to go up. So the number is going to have to get bigger. I go up 10%. If I'm going from yards to meters, I'm going down the alphabet. I subtract 10% and forget everything else if that's what you want. But that's just so the book does things like that and it breaks it down into sections by numbers. So you can go to the table of contents and jump straight to yard meter conversions if you want, mm-hmm. which you can't do with the podcast. Ah, that's a good point. So, um, one of the things I think you do well, and uh, you know, we we've said it here, is that you put things in terms people can understand. So there's a thing called the curse of knowledge, where you think like, oh, I know this, you know, everyone must know this. H- how do you get over that and explain things well? Like, is this is this something you've done since you were young, or is it the the uh, military training? Is it the lawyering, the the teaching? What is it? You seem to have like a natural gift for it. I appreciate that. I have no idea. I don't know if it's the teaching because I do <laughs> love teaching. I'm a big believer that a good teacher is better than a good shooter. Mm-hmm. You know, so having someone up there that is an amazing shooter but doesn't know how to teach isn't going to make you better. But I do believe I can take someone who's really good at teaching and I can teach them the basics of shooting and I think they'd be a better shooting coach just because there's an art to teaching that can be learned. It's not something you have or you don't. You can You can learn it. And I'm not saying I even have it. But uh, some people think uh, it, it can be condescending, you know, because uh, really? I, you know, because yeah, I'm like, well, for a minute of angle, I love to explain it with laser pointers. You've heard me in the video or in the book. I'm yeah, like, hey, yeah. You know, stop thinking of minute of angle as a size. Minute of angle is an angle. So is a mill, but it's an angular measurement. What I mean is, it's the same as saying 20 degrees. You don't ask me how many inches is 20 degrees. That's impossible to answer, <laughs> right? You realize I'm talking about an angle. So I say. I get people thinking about the angle first. Then I say, picture I had two laser pointers and I spread them apart one minute of angle. Now let's follow those dots as we go down range. At 100 yards, those dots are going to be about an inch apart. Well, what's going to happen at 200 yards? Well, you could visualize that they're going to be further apart. Yeah, it's going to be about two inches apart, but it's the same one minute of angle. Mm -hmm. And so I I break that down and most people love that. And that's, I think what you're referring to is those type of analogies to help people picture those things. Yeah. But then some other people are like, you don't got to talk to me like I'm a kid. Well, <laughs> I'm not trying. I don't assume that you need to know this, but I guess, yeah, maybe not, not being afraid to start at the basics. 
Yeah. Well, and I think uh, a lot of that comes from ego, right? And mm -hmm. our um, industry, our sport, our culture is, you know, for better or worse, very ego driven, you know, and mm -hmm. a lot of people have invested a lot of their self worth in being a good shooter. So mm -hmm. they, even if they have like a kind of a general understanding of MOA, you know, they're, or, you know, what a, what a minute of angle actually is, they're not mm -hmm. willing to listen to, the uh the full explanation and how you break it down because you know that means like well if if i listen to this then that means i don't know it you know so right or worrying about what matters like minutes yeah. of angle matters if you're going to use minutes of angle it matters if you full, really understand it so you can actually use it while you're shooting what twist rate your barrel is does not matter i know i just made a few people screech listening to the podcast yeah. <laughs> it doesn't matter what twist rate your barrel is when, when you're shooting guns in your hand you have a one in 12 twist barrel or a one in 10 twist barrel for 308. It's not something you can change. It's not something you can control. The rifle's mm -hmm. already in your hands. So, and when you shoot the 500 yard target for that with that 308, you know that you need to come up 12 minutes of angle. So, next time you go shoot a 500 yard target, you come up 12 minutes of angle. Does it matter if your barrel twist is different? No, it doesn't matter. I mean, maybe it mattered at the beginning when you had to figure out what you and that rifle had to do. But once you figured out what you and that rifle have to do at that distance, Stop freaking out about that stuff. Stop worrying about that stuff. And instead, think about minutes of angle or mills in chunks like I teach people to do. So this will apply to three-gun shooting. Mm -hmm. Is you need to start thinking not about the, like I say, the Wikipedia answer of what a minute of angle is, but realize that it's that angle does translate into a certain size, what I call a chunk at a certain distance. So if I were starting fresh, I would without a doubt start with mills. But I'm glad I you went there. Use can you, minutes can you so tell me why? Uh, it's simpler once it, it's harder for people like me because I started with minutes, but well, everyone wants to put minutes truly, into inches. Well, right? cause it's Every, a, it's close to inches. That's why. Right. Yeah. But, but I think that's where, where it comes from. And, you know, maybe like, you know, grandpa told you like, okay, well, you know, this is one MOA because there's a, an inch grid on a, on a target. Like yeah. maybe that's what it is. But, um, so give me a little bit more on why, why mill? But it's it's only because it's easy for the conversions. It's just minutes of angle isn't isn't precise. I don't care that it's really not precise. And I'm I'm the most imprecise precision shooter there is. I'm a big believer in good enough is good enough. You know, like I don't sit there with a wind meter in my hand when I'm shooting. I don't because I don't think the wind at me matters that much. I think the wind downrange matters more. You know, I even joke that if you're ever in some Hollywood sniper counter sniper scenario, which I'm never going to be in, but if I was someday. <laughs> I hope the other guy is pulling out a wind meter because I'm going to shoot him through his wind meter. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I'm going to shoot and I'm going to miss left by two feet. I'm going to reload, adjust two feet to the right and shoot again. And within while three seconds, I'm going to have a hit while he's doing a calculation. So was, I'm, I'm a big believer in good enough's good enough. But mills, uh, well, first, the most important thing is not minutes or mills. It's having turrets and a reticle that match. I mm -hmm. think that's most important. Whichever one you're going to do, make sure your turrets and reticle match, which we didn't have in the military uh, way back when. Uh, so at least as long as they match, that makes sense. And another piece of advice is use whatever your buddies use. So if your guys that you go shooting with are all mill guys, get mills or vice versa. If they're minutes guys, even though I just said that mills is probably a better system, uh, don't do it because you're going to be constantly converting with you and your buddies. I'd rather mm -hmm. have my buddies spotting for me and talking the same language. So no mills is just it. There's no conversion needed at all. It just, it works versus minutes of angle. You got to keep going back and forth and it's a mess. Right. I got it. Okay. So, um, I, that totally identifies with what I've chosen too. So that's probably why I like it, you know, cause that's how humans are. Right. Mm -hmm. But the, uh, as far as like good enough, um, mm -hmm. and it's, it's something that I've used like way back in my, my drag racing days, we'd always say, you know, good enough. And then we'd move on. Uh, and I, I think that fits my personality. Well, can, can you be like good enough in, in precision shooting because absolutely I, I, right I can name, make huh? you better if you let go of all the precision why is that so one is it's this is kind of a life lesson too i guess is focusing on what you can control okay okay um getting uh, let's say you put a wind meter at every 50 yards all the way to the target and had the wind meters at the height the bullet was actually going to travel and had them all plugged into a supercomputer that could do all the ballistic calculations of knowing the wind at every distance and you had the most precision turned 
you know, bullets with the exact ballistic coefficient and everything could is the best the best can be, which by the way has never existed. Anyone with this entire perfectly set up. Uh, as long as you're still involved, you're going to jerk the trigger possibly. <laughs> okay. Well, let's say you even made a perfect shot. Okay. And we're going to shoot uh, at a target where it takes a couple seconds for the bullet to get to the target. The most perfect, perfect, perfect calculation is irrelevant three seconds later when the wind changes. So even if you sat there and got everything perfect, as soon as you launch that bullet and the bullet leaves the barrel, the wind could die. Mm -hmm. Right? You're still going to miss then if the wind changes or gusts, even the bullet goes there. So my theory is not to say that we should just give up and not try at all. My theory is, you know, you can get out and shoot one round every five minutes because you're sitting there trying to calculate the spin of the earth. Or you can shoot more and get more practice not worrying about the spin of the earth and just getting good enough and having fun shooting. The other problem mm -hmm. people are too precise in is they try so hard that they end up missing. So this is a three gun tip for you. Long range shooting, by the way, doesn't, I don't think the principles apply necessarily only when you're shooting long distance. The bullet doesn't know when it leaves your rifle, if it's going to travel 10 yards or a thousand yards. Okay. Oh, that's a good point. I also don't pull the trigger differently. I don't say, oh, well, I'm shooting at a thousand yards. I'm going to use the thousand yard trigger technique. I use the same technique at 100 yards as I do at 1,000. Yep. I get just as stable when I'm shooting a group at 100 versus I'm shooting at 1,000. So nothing changes, which is why I don't even think the shooter needs to know the distance they're shooting. The spotter can give them the elevation and just shoot the target. That's also why the shooter is the junior guy on a sniper team. Because huh. once you learn how to pull the trigger, you do it the same every single time. Same cheek weld, same focus on the reticle, same steady pressure on the trigger, same stable platform. I could lie to you and tell you the distance. As long as I put the right dope on your scope, you're going to hit. It is irrelevant whether you knew it was actually 600 or 800 yards, right? So the problem that shooters have by trying to be too precise is they try too hard. And in three gun, this happens because you're unstable. And I make the, the analogy that it doesn't matter the distance you're shooting. So this principle applies in three gun at 150 yard target or a 200 yard target just as well is I know the monologue that goes through your head, Dave, and everyone else listening. <laughs> you pick up your rifle when you're unstable, and you put the reticle on the target, and you go, no, no, a little left, a little higher, a little bit, no, no a little lower, higher, oh, so, oh, right about now. Yep. You guys do that, right? Okay, Hell I yeah, do that I do. too. Okay, that's why you're missing. I smack the crap out of the trigger? Correct. Or you smack the crap out of the trigger because you're rushing the shot or you're forgetting about everything else because you're you're so worried about that. You also get too high a magnification on your scope because you think that's going to make you more accurate. And you magnify your errors and you end up focusing on the target. That's my biggest pet peeve with high magnification is people need to focus on their reticle. That's what they can control. There's that life lesson. Focus on what you can control. Focus on the reticle. You get a big pretty image of a target, you want to now stare and peek at that big pretty target. And when you're trying to go through the internal monologue of where it's going to be, you end up focusing so intently on the target that you can actually lose track of where the reticle is mm -hmm. and therefore make a bad shot. So what I would do with students is I would do this, we do this drill we call the LAPD drill after the North Hollywood shootout, is I would put a face target at 100 yards and ask them to shoot six rounds at the target. These are military law enforcement snipers. Two from the kneeling, two from the seated, two from the prone without bipods. So all semi-unsupported, sling-supported positions. You would have snipers from amazing units with amazing pedigrees, with incredible rifles and experience, fail at this drill. I'd give them 60 seconds for six shots. They had to transition and shoot. And they would have two out of six shots on the face. And I'd go down and they'd all be discouraged. And just because I might be the a-hole in type A sometimes, I'd pull out a Romanian Wasser 10 out of my truck and I would do the drill with the Wasser 10 and get six out of six. Huh. All right, guys. Wasser 10, iron sights, Russian ammo. What's the difference here? I only need to shoot six minutes of angle. You know, if you're using my head, eight minutes of angle, right? Uh, so <laughs> what, whatever you need to do, what's the problem here? Well, the problem isn't the rifle or the dope or that it's you. And I would talk about the biggest thing I would want to leave you all with. And this is an acceptable amount of accuracy. So stop trying to be too precise and figure out what's acceptable. Well, at that distance six minutes of angle is acceptable. Mm -hmm. So stop trying to make a one minute of angle shot. Instead, allow the reticle to move within the six minutes of angle. And as it's moving around, start applying steady pressure to the trigger. And when the gun goes off, even if the reticle's at the very edge of the target, that's a hit. You just defined that the target was anywhere within the six inch circle. 
So if you defined that, accept that. And take that hit at the edge, then try a shot again, let the reticle move, apply pressure, keep focusing on the reticle. I don't care if the reticle is down at the bottom corner when the gun goes off, that's a hit right in the bottom corner. Mm -hmm. That's called an acceptable amount of accuracy. The problem is if you try and be too much into the center, you do that monologue, you're moving, you're moving, you get it dead centered, and then you jerk the rifle completely off the target. And by trying to be too precise, you end up missing. So on three gun, when it's unsupported, when you're breathing heavy, when you're moving, allow that reticle to move and go back to shooting a group. Go back to thinking pressure, 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 bang. That slow of a shot and a hit is way better than picking it up and trying to choose to make it go off. Right. And then, uh, you know, having five or six makeup shots and you could have just used that time to get one good shot. Correct. So, or you had the scope magnification backed off enough that you weren't worrying about the target too much. You weren't mm -hmm. trying to be too quote unquote precise that you see where the impact was and you can adjust from it. You know, uh, magnification is something, uh, something interesting. So when I started shooting three gun, uh, I, I had like an aim point. I forgot what the heck it, uh, the model was, but it was the four MOA dot. And that's basically all I shot because, yeah. you know, in Colorado, our matches went out to 200 yards. Um, I re recall having a friend that had like a Burris M tac one to four, which was like the scope to have at the time. And I remember that, that four power was like incredible. You know, and now I shoot a Vortex Razor one to six and it's like, oh, this is amazing. Yeah. But so many times I see um, a lot of people talking on like three gun Facebook groups like, oh, when are they going to have a one to eight? When is there going to be a one to ten? This and that. And people are like, oh, you know, I like the like the Razor. Wish I had more magnification. And I've found in just my, you know, some brief experiences, nothing compared to, to what you have, that exactly what you said, that the the uh chasing the magnification is like a fool's errand because like you said you do become too precise if you can zoom in on say like a a bc zone that you're shooting at like 450 yards and you can see where the bolt is you're going to aim for the the bolt that's holding it on the target rather than just yep. like an acceptable hit on that target or you're going to freak out about all the it really does just magnify your errors you're going to freak out about all the moving that's going on you're going to try yeah. too hard to rush the shot you need enough magnification to see the target that's it so you define the target. If your target is the entire silhouette anywhere on an E-type silhouette or a Ipsic silhouette, then you should have enough magnification to see the silhouette. That's it. Right. I mean, if you now if you decided that your target is the A zone, okay, now you need enough magnification to see the A zone because you're the one that picked your target. But anything more than that is actually going to be detrimental. I will see over and over, even just shooting groups at 100 yards, people having trouble shooting groups that I'll walk up to and grab their magnification and crank it down. You know, like mm -hmm. the old loophole Mark IV from three and a half to 10 power. Crank it down to three and a half power and say, shoot another group. I can barely see the target. I know, shoot another group. It's almost always a better group at three and a half power versus 10. And it happens all the time. It's the same, the old NRA trick for pistol shooters. When people are having trouble with a handgun hitting the bullseye, they flip the card around to the white side and most people get a better group oh, without no the kidding. target at all. They try it. Take a piece of paper with a handgun, flip it around. You end up with a better group because you're not focusing on the target. You're just focusing on your iron sights and what matters. Same thing happens with magnification. So I power it down. I was shooting some stupid groups the other day with the same thing with the one to six, just having fun at distances. Be like, oh, BS. That was only six power. I'm like, guys, people that can shoot a lot better than any of us were doing longer distances with iron sights. Yeah. So how is that possible? Well, it's because it's only the fundamentals that matter. As long as you can see the target, you'll be fine. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, I spent, uh, I think, three months shooting a, a 1X optic in, in competitions in preparation for the Colorado State Championship. And I, I found that, you know, not caring as much about how much fidelity I had on the target actually made it um, much faster. And then um, when you when you realize, like, your your rifle is moving just the same as it would if you had a six power scope on there, although now you're seeing less movement and you're carrying less, uh, once you have that realization, it kind of helps you shoot uh, long range with actual magnification after that. Well, have you ever had trouble finding a target in a three gun match? Oh yeah. Do, do, you, the, the, do you normally have to go up in magnification to find it or down to find it? Down. Yeah. There you go. So why are you going high in the first place? Yeah, exactly. Right? So everyone out there try, I don't like shooting groups. I'm not the best group shooter out there anyway. I like more, realistic tactical shooting like you would do in a three gun match. But if you are shooting a group and you're not happy with your performance, cut the power in half, see what happens. Mm -hmm. 
Well, okay. So let's, let's talk about like, uh, you know, since you're into the tactical practical applications, let's talk about it like practical application. So for this, this last weekend, I was at the Wyoming governor's match and you know, we had targets out to 530 yards. I don't know if you knew this, but on the plains of Wyoming, it's kind of windy yeah. So and rolling hills. And so there's, you're looking at a wide array of t- say five or six targets. There's different wind for, for each of them. Yeah. Um, the, the, uh, the wind calls become important. The, you know, obviously ballistics, you're shooting uphill, stuff like that. If I'm shooting, say, like a 77 grain, 75 grain, 69 grain, 223 out of a, out of a, um, you know, AR 15, what, how do I approach that stage and, and, uh, um, take in all the data before that buzzer goes off that I need for success? Uh, wow. That's, that's a whole podcast right there. Yeah. Uh, if we're talking just wind, which I think we should for the beginning, because, I have to assume from a from a starting point that the shooter knows what they're doing. They know the dope for their gun. They know how to shoot. If you don't, stop going and trying to figure out wind. Right? Okay. So the Coriolis effect, what I talked about, the spin of the earth, it does matter. It does affect the bullet. Unless you can, however, shoot a 10-inch group repeatedly at 1,000 yards, stop worrying about it because it's such a minuscule amount. So same thing with wind. Wind is... So the biggest variable on your bullet that's going to affect the path of your bullet is gravity. Mm -hmm. The good news is it's the easiest to account for. The second biggest variable, usually, well, it does change technically, but it's mostly the same around wherever you're shooting. The second biggest variable is wind. And the bad news is it's the hardest to account for because even if you do figure it out, like I said, it changes. So yes, wind's important, but until you can master you and your gun, let's not throw too many variables at it stay at the range and shoot at one and 200 yards and get good at groups, even with positional shooting. That's another thing, by the way, get your ass off the bench, shoot a group and then shoot off barricades, then shoot standing. You you should be able to hit these smaller targets at these standing and unsupported positions, especially doing a bunch of jumping jacks first and picking up your rifle and trying to do it. Yeah. Then start working about with those benches to shoot from in, uh, in three gun or precision shooting. Say that again. They usually don't give us benches to shoot from in exactly precision right. shooting. Or so I tell hunters up. all the time, take a paper plate, put it at whatever distance you want to get good at. Take a paper plate and put it at two or 300 yards and stand there and keep shooting your hunting rifle so you can hit the paper plate every time. Because mm-hmm. you need to be able to hit a kill zone standing. And then if you really want to get good, like I said, do jumping jacks or get your heart rate up and try and do it. Because I've never found a shooting bench out in the field. Yeah. All right. Same true. thing. So that's the kind of shooting you need to get at. The bench is there to get a good group. But master that first. So all this wind talk we're about to get into ignore come back to this podcast after you can shoot like that six inch target six minutes of angle guys that's horrible accuracy but come back after you can hit a six minute of angle target at 100 yards so a six inch target after doing jumping jacks after running a sprint around the range coming back and picking up the iphone standing master that first okay then we'll add this stuff on later so now once you've done that and we're going to talk about wind you're shooting a 223 which means the wind's going to blow your bullet all over the place it's mm-hmm. just going to happen heavier bullets probably going to be better for you uh, speed uh, isn't everything. A uh, faster bullet is not more accurate. I think that's a big misnomer people have. Uh, but what a faster bullet does get you is it gets you less effect by the wind and gravity. Now, don't mistake that. That's not because the bullet has some sort of momentum that somehow resists the wind or gravity. I think a lot of people think that. That right. if it's going so fast horizontally that somehow gravity can't touch it. No, it's, it's just not less true at all. time touched by gravity, right? 100% time. Yep. Every object falls the same speed, right? You drop a bullet next to the barrel of a perfectly level gun and shoot a bullet at the exact same time. They both will hit the ground at the same time. The one you shot is just going to hit the ground way further away from you Mm -hmm. because the sideways speed has nothing to do with the downward speed of gravity. So it's all about the time, right? So a faster bullet gets to the target faster. So if it takes two seconds for whatever bullet you were shooting, to get to the target, it's going to fall as far as that object would fall in two seconds. And it's going to blow as far as an object would blow when it's exposed to two seconds of wind. I almost analogize that to taking an air compressor nozzle and following along with the bullet and spraying the bullet for two seconds, Mm -hmm. how much it's going to blow it off course. Well, you get a bullet that's twice as fast and now it gets to the target in one second. Well, it's going to fall less because it has less time to fall. Right. And it's going to be deviated by the wind less because you only get a one second blast from the air nozzle versus a two second blast. So that's where a fast bullet can help you with the wind. However, with 223, even though it's a pretty quick bullet, it's also light. So now you only have a one second blast with the air nozzle, but you're blowing a ping pong ball, something really light. So it's easily <laughs> moved by the wind, right? So you have all these variables that all play into it, which is why there's no perfect anything. 
Um, I would be doing the best I could to confirm the distance before I got to the stage. I'd like to have my own laser rangefinder or mm -hmm. my own way to confirm or, or believe the distances are actually what they're saying they are because you'd be surprised sometimes. Oh, man. And then, uh, so sorry to interrupt you there. My hard and fast rule is never, ever accept a distance call from a stage brief or an RO. And even if you know that RO's first name, <laughs> you know, always <laughs> confirm it yourself because uh, I've been uh, burned by that one several times. Yeah, so bring your own laser range finder. Um, and then I would spend the rest of the time that you had watching the wind. So, I mean, even during the stage brief, as you're listening, if they don't care that you have a pair of binoculars up to your face while you're listening to the stage brief, you should just be watching the wind and going, huh, what's that doing? Yeah, it's going left to right out there, but the mirage, you know, the heat waves aren't moving very much, but they're picking up between the further targets. That's interesting. And just keep watching. Mm -hmm. Ooh, look at that. The wind's gusting a little bit. Oh, there's a flag down there or there's a tree. Oh, wow. That tree is moving the same direction the wind is. Oh, and the wind changed and so did the tree. Aha, there's my, there's my identifier. All right, I want to watch that tree for that target. You know, what's going on with that wind? Ooh, the dirt's just constantly be asking yourself. And what you do is you get a feel. Wind is a flow thing. It's like fluid. You start to watch it. You get a picture of what's going on and just keep, keep watching. I mean, in, in Sodic, uh, the sniper school I went to in the military, uh, you would have some of your tests. They'd have the instructors back there, with these giant Swarovski spotting scopes as the instructors. Yeah. And they would challenge you on the unknown distance you know, range to get certain hits and certain distances. And the spotter would come back to the instructor and the instructor would move the spotting scope and go that target right there. And you'd look through the spotting scope to see the target they're talking about. And they would give you like 30 seconds to get a certain number of hits on the target. So you had to run up to your shooter, talk your shooter onto the target, figure out the distance, you know, to get the right elevations, get the wind call and engage the target. Well, one of the models I had from the military was if you're not cheating, you're not trying. And if you get caught cheating, you're not trying hard enough. So <laughs> we would go to the, to the instructor's spotting scope. He's like, that target right there, you see it? Well, I'd look in this giant, like 110 millimeter Swarovski spotting scope, which is amazing for seeing the wind mm -hmm. and just do nothing but look at the wind. Go, huh. Looks a little left to right, a little bit of angle. Hey, Clackner, you see the target? Uh, no, Sergeant. No, looking for the target still. Yeah, okay, the wind's doing... I would spend the entire time getting a wind call huh, because that was okay. the most important thing. You should right. be doing that before the stage, right? Fun, fine, have fun, joke around, have a good time. But if you have a chance for other people to shoot in front of you, watch them. Watch when they miss, too. Watch how when you thought the wind was going left to right, how the dirt that kicked up actually went right to left. And then go, oh, wait, I was wrong. That's, by the way, knowing when you're wrong, I would rather you miss, if I was teaching you to shoot, Dave, mm -hmm. I'd rather that you missed and told me why you missed than have you hit and have no idea why you hit. Because as long oh, as you okay. know what went wrong, you can learn from that. If you right. are accidentally good, we're never going to make you a better shooter. <laughs> right? Well, so, and that's one thing that you've talked about in your, in your uh, podcast a few times is the uh, uh, communication with uh -huh. the uh, spotter and the sniper, right? And especially when you have like a student out there. Your first question is, was that a good uh, trigger pull? You know, were you on target? Was everything okay? Not, um, you know, not the not not the first communication is the correction, right? So well, I'd rather you not know you even hit. Yeah, if I, especially yeah. if I'm teaching somebody or working with a like as a sniper team, I'm not gonna go over and go great hit high five. Right. I'm like, how was that shot? And you'd be surprised how per when a perfect result happens, the person when you ask them, they go, oh, I kind of pulled it. I did, I did this and I did that. Oh, all right. Well, let's work on that next time. Let's try it again. And they go, well, wait a minute. How was the shot? It doesn't matter. Try it again. We need to get you better at shooting, right? So I would watch the wind out there at the stage and I would, no matter what, I would pay attention to the wind. What I mean is you'd be surprised how many times people will shoot at a 300 yard target. And I ask them, is there any wind out there? And they say, yeah, there's a little bit. It's left to right. I can feel it on my skin a little bit. I can see it out there a little bit. It's going left to right. But I don't know, is it's two miles an hour or five miles an hour or 10? I, I, I don't know how much left to right it is, but it's just maybe a little bit. Okay. So there's your scenario. Maybe a little bit left to right wind, 300 yard target. You'd be surprised how many people will aim at the center of the target. To which right. I'm going to say, well, you just told me there's wind. Go, yeah, but I don't know how much. I don't know how much to calculate. Well, if you aim at the center, you're guaranteed either that you're going to hit exactly where you're aiming or the bullet is going to be blown to the right, uh -huh. which means you've given yourself half of the target width to work with. Right. Why in the world would you not aim at the left edge? So even if you're not going to do a calculation, at least being aware there's a left to right wind, you are going to give yourself twice as wide of a target than everyone else. Okay. So uh, then if you, if you hold the center 
and you mm-hmm. do miss just off the right edge, you call a miss or someone, you know, you're in a match where someone can call that miss for you. What do you do with your correction? You make bold adjustments. I think you're setting me up for that one. I think you yeah, do the answer I, on that one. Yes, yeah, so if you miss an inch off the right side of the target, people will, without thinking about it, they'll miss an inch to the right. And first off, if you're out there practicing, stop talking about how much you missed. That's one of my pet peeves too as students. I don't ever allow them to talk about the miss. I what? make them talk about what they need to do to get a hit. Okay. Why is that? Okay. Well, one, it doesn't matter because the end end point of the discussion of how much you missed ends up being how to make the hit anyway. Mm-hmm. Why not shut up and shoot before the wind changes? Right? It's a very good so point. Here's what happens with people. Bang. Oh, I think I missed. Yeah, you missed. Oh, where was it? Oh, just off the side. Oh, which side? Oh, the right side? How far? I don't know. Hmm. Probably about like an inch. The hell of the elevation. Yeah, elevation looked good. Man, that was a cool shot. Dang it. We're, we're going to get it. Well, go a little bit further left this time. How much? I don't know. Um, <laughs> get it That's the right. discussion. Ryan, this right? conversation reminds me of like when a call's dropped and uh, you call back and they're like, was that you or me? It doesn't effing matter. We're back on the phone now. So let's finish <laughs> yes. this conversation. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So that's that's exactly the conversation that happens and none of that matters. All that's going to do is cause confusion. Now, we're not, I'm not training snipers anymore, but you are under some stress and a three gun match. You're trying to, if you are trying to work together or shoot, you know what you should do is the shooter should shoot and call the shot, good or bad. Mm-hmm. The spotter should see where the miss was. And make an adjustment. So if you miss an inch off the right side of the target, it does no good to tell them they mid- missed an inch to the right and then have to say, aim more left. Why don't you just <laughs> say, aim more left? Right? Right. It's a lot faster and it's less confusing too. And you're like, wait, left, right? Which one did you say? So what you do though, when you miss an inch off the right side of the target, let's call it an ipsic target. You miss an inch off the right. Many people will go, oh man, you missed just an inch off the right. Well, let's see. That's 600 yards. So a minute of angle at 600 yards is like six inches. That's a quarter. Do a quarter minute left. No, you don't adjust by how much you missed off the edge because you're not trying to shoot the edge. You're trying to shoot the center. So you always measure from the center of the target. So if we were shooting, Dave, and you sh- you shot, you told me it was a good shot, and I saw the bullet just graze off the right side of the target, mm-hmm. all I'm going to say is aim at the left side of the target. It doesn't matter oh, how many minutes that is or how many mils that is. Or even what the distance is. I know under these wind conditions with that rifle and with you, if you aim at the center, the the bullet blows a half of the target width to the right. So I'm just going to have you aim at the left edge of the target, let the bullet blow into the center. And you and I together in five seconds would have a hit on the target when other people would be still discussing how close it was. <laughs> I, I love that. I love the uh, the simplicity of it. And I, I love the uh, the bold correction. So for for me... Uh, you know, I told the story at the start of the show, my, my friend, Josh told me about your podcast when we were on our way to shoot a match. We shot this match in Texas, ton of wind, ton of long range shooting. And, uh, later on when I heard you talk about bold corrections on your podcast, uh, like immediately it's like, shit, I could have used that like before the match because, uh, I found myself making those small corrections as well. Like if you're one inch off the target, oh, well, yeah. shoot, hold, you know, two inches more to the left, you know, and again, I was thinking in those units, uh, hold two inches more to the left and then you'll you'll hit the target but you're like you said you're hitting the target and you're only giving yourself a partial target to work with whereas yeah. like a bold correction will give you the entire target to work with anyway well and a bold correction at least on my third shot i'll get it so what i mean is most people if you're honest with yourselves and you had to take multiple shots of the target I'm talking like five shots and you had to keep adjusting to try and hit it mm-hmm. most of the time you inched your way there right right half mil left three quarters mil left full mil left Mill and a quarter left, mill and a half left. Got it. Why don't you just say two mils left the first time? Yeah. Go crazy. Go way too much. And well, at and least if you miss on the other side of the target, you can see now exactly what the two mil difference looks like and you know exactly the right hold now. You've given yourself like a measuring tape out there. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. So instead of going, ooh, that's what a quarter mill did and then having to picture a bunch more of those quarter mills to get the target, go too far. Mm-hmm. You might not hit it, but at least on the third shot you will. Well, and you'll hear hear people just uh, talk about that in a discussion a lot. Like, oh yeah, I made a shot at, you know, six hundred yards. I had to walk it in, so it took me a few rounds. Like, why don't you leap it in? Exactly right. You, it, it's to well, I can see arguments for both sides, but for me, especially if I'm trying to help someone learn, I'd rather leap past it because then I know exactly how far to come back rather than right. inching my way there. Right. Um, that's the other thing for a spotter. If you're working together, why you should have the same units of measurement is I would like the spotter to always be holding the wind call that the shooter holds. Okay. So if let's say we're shooting mill scopes and I tell you to hold one mill left, 
that means you're moving your reticle to the left of the target one mil, which actually means that you're using the mil dot to the right of the reticle on the target. That confuses yes. people a lot. So I ask people when you get a wind call to always ask yourself the direction first, then how much. And back to the measuring tape analogy, it doesn't matter which way you measure 12 inches. It's 12 inches either way, right? Mm -hmm. So the mills in your reticle are just a measuring tape. So think of the direction first, then the unit. So I tell Dave, Dave, hold one mill left. I want you to think, all right, I'm going to move it to the left and then stop at the, the first mill I get to. Okay, so there's your one mill left hold. I, as a spotter, should be holding one mill left also. So when you shoot and I see the bullet impact right at the mill and a half mark, all I have to say is mill and a half left. Because I, gotcha. I now know exactly what the right call is for you. If I don't hold the same wind call, I have to go, man, he missed by about this many feet. That's about a half a mil. That was, what was the wind call? That was a mil. So it's a mil, about a mil and a half left. Why don't you just hold it? Huh, right? Okay. And you just watch where it impacts on the reticle and tell them that's the new wind call. And now we have really fast communication. Or as we started adopting in the military, you have a follow up shot. If I'm already holding the one mil left and I see your bullet impact, I can just move the half mil and pull the trigger. And now you have a super quick follow up shot with a perfect wind call. I got gotcha. so okay. you. There you go. Wow, that makes a lot of sense. All right. So, some sometimes we'll have you know matches where coaching is allowed and they can call your your misses right if you need to brief someone in say the 15 minutes leading up to you shooting what is how much information would you give them and to to help you i mean all selfish right you need to give them as much information as possible in a short amount of time to help you achieve uh hits what are you going to tell them so they're allowed to tell me it's anything more than hit or miss Yes. Yeah. So some some matches, and specifically one I'm thinking of is the Vortex Shooter Source Three Gun Championship. Uh, mm -hmm. Coaching is allowed. So if you're running through like a running gun stage with your pistol, they can go two on the right, two on the left. You missed that one. Come back. You know that kind of thing. So okay, that, that mm -hmm. type of coaching is allowed. And sometimes we're allowed to do it for juniors too. Just depends on the match rules, right? Mm -hmm. So that's that's the context I'm thinking of. Now, in that case, I will break my normal advice because I'm assuming I don't know this person and I'm just doing it for just this match. Yeah. I would just have them shout out which direction I missed, honestly. Oh, that's okay. That's horrible advice. That's not what I would normally do, but we're talking in the middle of a stage on a match. Right. right? I'd either ask them to just stay quiet and let me shoot it and tell me when I got my hits because I probably will be able to figure out what I'm doing. But if I do need the help, it's just going to be sometimes you have bushes or stuff out there. You have no idea if you missed left or right. Right. I'd like to know. And I'm going to make the adjustment. I don't want them giving me adjustments because I don't know who they are. Uh -huh, right. Yeah, so okay. I'm going, oh, give me half minute, half mil more left. Okay. <laughs> no, I mean to the right. <laughs> Wait, no, I mean, I don't want yeah. that. Well, like, and uh, they can be doing the thing that we were talking about too, of walking it in rather than making correct. it. Correct. So the numbers are just going to mess with me. The only reason I would need help is if I didn't see where the impact was. And right. so just telling me it's to the left, I have no problem making a bold adjustment the other way. You know, to do it. Matter of fact, if you're shooting a long range target just for practice and you can't tell where the bullet is, be bold that way too. You're like, man, did that go to the bushes behind it or to the bush? I don't know if it hit or what. Just go two mils up high, left or right, and shoot the trigger again and then see where the bullet impacts and give yourself an idea. So I would probably just have them do that. Now, if it was my partner, I would coach him up on how to actually communicate. Mm -hmm. And I'd have them like uh, the little vortex monoculars I love that have the yeah. reticle in them. So they could just sit there with a monocular with a reticle in it and be shooting. And we can be calling out the hits and misses or exactly what they need to be doing. I'd rather that. But if it's a stranger, yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd kind of not want the math to conflict. Right. Yeah. And I, I love that, uh, that optic too. I've got one of those reckies in my, um, mm -hmm. my uh, console and it's, uh, it's an eight power it's, and my scope's a six power, but it has the same reticle. And so I love to use that in walkthrough to, to see what I'm going to be seeing. Exactly right. And just speaking the same language can really, really help. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, I've watched a lot of uh, a lot of Hollywood movies. I've seen Sniper with Tom Berenger many, many times, and he uh, preaches the one shot, one kill, right? And yeah. you seem to be the opposite of like throw one out there and see what it does, and then make a correction from there. Yeah, I'm I'm one box, one kill. <laughs> yeah, uh, I like that. Fact, great I was teacher, way. He and I were he and I were joking around about that, and he said actually in one of their team rooms. So Delta Force Sniper. One of their team members in the door, they had one box, one kill as the motto on the door. Just because one shot, one kill, sure, that's what we all want to get, but that's not always practical. Mm -hmm. You know, bad guys change directions when they're walking. They stop to tie their shoe or take their sandal off when the bullet's mid-flight. You can't control everything. Right. You know? But instead of sitting there worrying about it, you know, shooting, seeing that it was two feet to the right, 
having a good enough shot that when you as soon as you see the impact, adjusting two feet and shooting again, within two seconds you just got a hit. Mm-hmm. Maybe sometimes that works. Well, and and in uh, competition we don't need to be surreptitious, right? So we we can throw ciders out there, you know, to uh, to see what the wind is doing. Right. Make make your first best guess, but then adjust off of that. Here's another thing: don't worry about why it missed. That's that's the other life lesson thing too. Is when I say don't focus on the misses. Sometimes people get their head so wrapped around why they missed. So I was just in South Africa doing that hunt, and I was there with a buddy of mine, and he we got to you know confirm zero on the rifles when we first got there before we went out hunting, and he shot and he was like two minutes low from where he normally his zero normally is, and it just destroyed his brain. He's like, did, did the scope get damaged in transit, or is it mm-hmm. the ammo, or is it or is it? And I'm sitting there laughing, going, just adjust up two minutes. Who cares? Yeah. Like, well, no, but is the could my barrel have gotten bent because the crown had gotten damaged, or or what could have happened? I don't want the scope. It doesn't matter why it's two minutes low. Come up two minutes and let's go hunt. And we kept talking about that for the next few days because he just still couldn't wrap his mind around it. Same thing at a match. <laughs> Who cares why it went five mils to the right? You know what you need to do to hit? Hold five mils left. Get a hit. Yeah. Then later figure out if you accidentally left a full revolution of windage on your scope. But what matters now is hitting the target, mm-hmm. right? That's so why I tell people too about the, the twist rate of your barrel, as I already brought up before, or the markings on your turret. Who cares if you have shapes on your turret? If you know that you have to turn to triangle to hit the target, then turn to triangle and hit the target. Stop stressing about, well, that went low, but I thought it was at 300. Well, maybe it's not 300. Maybe it's this. Maybe it's, well, did I get my adjustment right? I did. Am I on the right power? What? You know what? Yeah. That's for later. Oh, I hit low. Aim higher. Now I hit it. Then go back and diagnose. Does that make sense? It do- It totally does. I see this a lot of times in the uh, the zero range as well. You know, um, if if a match has zero range, it's generally under a hundred yards. Sometimes it's fifty, and I'll see you know guys. You know, the, we travel long distances, elevations different, climates different, et, et cetera. So they'll go and get their their zero. Uh, I'll I'll do it sometimes too. Generally, I I don't have enough long range ammo to uh, sit and throw a bunch of rounds around there. Um, but I'll see some people say, okay, well, you know, it's it's a uh, you know, a half inch off at 50 yards or it's an inch off at 50 yards and it shouldn't be like that. And I'm trying to figure it out. It's like, dude, just click that little dialy thing and uh, yeah. get it to where it, it hits that black mark and let's go shoot. Exactly right. I mean, figure it out someday. If your gun's broken, figure it out later. But right, right now, it doesn't matter. What matters right now is you missed one direction. Make a correction and hit the target. Right. Hmm. right. Yeah, exactly. All right, Ryan. Well, you brought brought up the uh, you know speed, speed of the bullet weight of the bullet um talk so i want to kind of dig into that a little bit here and then uh we're gonna ha- i'm gonna have a last couple questions here we're gonna let you uh go because we you were you were concerned but we've actually done about 70 minutes here already so i, I warned you so i talk a lot we'll we'll make it work no it's totally fine I, lo- I love it uh the the light bullet versus the heavy bullet so in three gun like with uh with that context you know 55 grain versus say a 75 or 77 grain something like that um, if you are shooting a precision target, not just blaster hose or paper targets on the, uh, on the range, mm-hmm. is there a better than the other? Yeah, the heavier. Definitely. If you're going for precision, no matter the distance, go the 75 or 77. Why? Uh, two reasons. One is most precision bullets are the heavier weighted bullets for two, two, three. Okay. Most 55 grain bullets you're going to find are plinking bullets. What about right. like uh, varmint loads? Like they make super light uh, rounds to explode prairie dogs. Yeah, they sure do. My my, and they can be accurate for sure. They're probably not match grade rounds, mm-hmm. meaning the ogive or the curve of the bullet might not be perfectly suited to go into most people's chambers. Mm-hmm. You know, the shape okay. of the bullet might be more for the varmint hunting. So there's two schools of thought here. One is we're uh, first off we're talking less wind deflection, right? Because if the bullet's accurate, it's accurate. We're, we're, what you're asking me is which one's going to move in the wind less or maybe less adjustment for distance, right? Right. Okay. So two schools of thought. One is get a heavy enough bullet that the wind can't blow it off course. Or two is get a fast enough bullet that the wind doesn't have enough time to blow it off course. Mm-hmm. Well, both are perfectly valid solutions. I prefer the heavier because I like hitting the target harder and smacking the steel and knocking it down or seeing the impact in the dirt more. That's one reason for heavier bullet. But just the other really is something about a longer, skinnier bullet tends to fly better in the air. It just really does better. So I like 75, 77 grain match bullets for shooting precision distance. 
they buck the wind a little better. They stay on course better. They tend to group better for me and they definitely hit the target harder. I gotcha. Okay. So the, uh, the, when you're talking about, when you're talking about speed, so a faster bullet is touched by wind less, a heavier bullet is affected by wind less, right? Is there like a magic combination or sort of, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Is there a magic combination of heavy and fast? in say a two, two, three cartridge. Cause again, that's our context that, uh, that is going to provide you both. Uh, I think I broken record here. I think the best of both worlds is the 75 grain bullet. I think it's still fast enough. I don't think a lighter bullet gets you fast enough to make an appreciable wind difference. Oh, okay. But I think the, the higher weight on the scale of the equation there works better. Mm -hmm. There's no perfect anything though. I mean, there's right. 6.5 bullets are probably the perfect, I mean, we've we've known this for over 100 years now. People are just starting to figure it out here with 6.5 Creedmoor. But, you know, the Finnish military did a test, I think, in 1903, where they just did all these ballistic calculations and tests on what the perfect diameter bullet was in 6.51 because it was the right size for the density of lead and copper and for the length and everything just to be, you know, super efficient. Huh. Well, <laughs> just like the firearms industry, we're a little slow to catch on. Yeah, they're like, oh, yeah. So, yeah, Americans running around going, look at this 6.5 Creedmoor, it's amazing. And a bunch of Swedish dudes are like, yeah, we figured that out a long time ago. <laughs> um, yeah. So, I mean, even the 260 Remington is essentially a 6.5 Creedmoor. Mm -hmm. It just never is took right? off because, yeah, there's, there's, I think, not even a full gram of water capacity difference between the cases. Same overall length, same bullet, same velocity, same magazine, same parent case, same everything. The 260 huh. have slightly more. I mean, like not even a gram of water more case capacity. So you can get that bullet going a little faster. But because it's got a little bit more capacity, the neck is a little further out, which means you can't get the bullet seated out as, as far. Right. So the 65 kind of does it. Yeah, 260 and 65 are essentially a wash. So is that um, is that as similar as like a 223 and a 556 are? Uh, yes. Okay. It is. Because 223 and 556 are different on pressure. Right. Right, so you, and the, you should, you the should never shoot a, little, a, five, a little, bit. little bit different, right? Yep, you should never shoot a five five six in a two two three, but you can do the opposite. Right. Uh, three hundred eight is actually flip flopped. The military flavor, the seven six two NATO, is actually weaker than three hundred eight Winchester. Huh, so okay. believe it or not, the military people think military is the hotter, more powerful. Well, no, in two two three it is, but not for the three hundred eight. Right. So anyway, I got gotcha. you. Okay. So yeah, there 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 can there's never a perfect bullet, which is why. Uh, every year we come out with the newest new fad and I just don't get it. I don't, I've only recently bought into 6.5 Creedmoor. I think it's been two months ago now. I finally said, all right, I'll shoot 6.5 Creedmoor because yes, it's better. It's better on paper without a doubt, but mm -hmm. so is everything else. Every year, a new cartridge comes out that's better on paper, right. but I wanted a bullet that I could find and I go to a match and I forgot my TSA lost my ammo. You know, I want to be able to go to the sporting goods store and get the ammo. And it was two months ago when I saw that Walmart had three SKUs of 6.5 Creedmoor and only two SKUs of 308 on the shelves. Ooh. I was like, that's my sign. 6.5 Creedmoor is here to stay. <laughs> I mean, if I would have adopted 260 when it came out, which is ballistically the same dang thing, I'd be out of luck. Where are you going to find 260? Yeah, and there's uh, like 6.5 Grendel, 6.8 something or other. That, 6.8 uh, SPC, 30 yeah. AR, 224 or what? Two whatever Valkyrie, what is it? Yeah, uh, 224 Valkyrie. Yeah, I, I don't get that one at all. Why would you want a tiny little hole again? You know, isn't well, people isn't say well, look, at paper, look at the ballistics, look at the velocity. Well, first off, even Federal is having to admit that those velocities aren't attainable in the real world. Mm -hmm. Okay, but even if they are, you see the length of those barrels at Shot Show. I could tell when every rifle on the wall was a 224 Valkyrie because it had like a 26 inch barrel on an AR-15. Right. I'm like, of course you can get a big velocity on a super long barrel. <laughs> Shocker. Course, what, how, is, how is that better? And they say, well, I said, why would you take that over 6.5 Creedmoor? And they say, well, I can get these great velocities. I said, you can have better performance of a 6.5 Creedmoor, hands down. And I go, well, we can do this out of an AR-15 receiver. And I come back with, why does that matter? And they say, well, an AR-10 receiver is like an inch longer. I'm like, okay. So you'll put a 26-inch barrel on a gun <laughs> to use an inch shorter receiver. Okay. <laughs> now, 224 Valkyrie might take off. I would have been wrong about 6.5 Creedmoor. I mm -hmm. thought 6.5 Creedmoor was just as much of, not a fad, but a niche cartridge as 6.5 by 47 Lapua as it was with 260 Remington, as it was any of the other ones in the same family. Mm -hmm. But somehow 6.5 Creedmoor took off. Awesome. I'm finally adopting it now. And I, I'm glad I didn't adopt the 260 or I'd have a bunch of guns in a caliber that I can't find anywhere. Yeah. I'm, uh, I'm kind of the same way. And 
three gun's really great for me because then it forces me to use two, two, three, 12 gauge and nine millimeter. And then I have a reason for saying like, ah, I'm not going to buy any more stuff. Yeah. Two, two, three works really good. Those heavy bullets and two, two, three are magic, man. Yeah. So grain bullets are great. So on the, on the Valkyrie, uh, uh, beating a dead horse kind of thing, I don't understand the, um, the allure of getting something really tiny like that for long range pr precision when you can just do a, a 308 or a 65 Creedmoor, it, why would we s step backwards in diameter and bullet weight? I don't understand that. Because you might have as much 223 ammo as you want. And if you get a new gun, you now need to go buy 5,000 more rounds of 224 Valkyrie and a new gun. Oh. And the firearms industry is in the business of selling guns and ammo. Right. I gotcha. So now you want 224 Valkyrie? New gun, buddy. Bunch more <laughs> ammo. That's why they do it. Now, it might be an improvement. I mean, 6.5 Creamer is an improvement. I think 308 was an improvement over 30 out 6 and other cartridges. I'm not saying we shouldn't have advancements. I'm just saying, let's everybody hold off on the newest fangled fad and let it get adopted. Let it get going for a while. Mm -hmm. Or else, like I already said, you'd, you'd have a, a bunch of 260s right now. And you'd be like, dang it, I should have waited for the 6.5 Creed more. And dang it, I should have waited for the whatever. So, you know, largely stick with something NATO that you can find anywhere in the world. You can find your know, cheap blinking ammo. Uh, I'm even now the parts of the military have adopted 6.5 Creedmoor. That's another reason I finally went to it. SOCOM mm -hmm. is taking 6.5 Creedmoor. They're actually getting 6.5 Creedmoor belt fed machine guns right now. No way. Yep, 100%. I, I know the company linking the ammo and I know the company making the machine guns. Huh. Uh, they are getting belt fed. 6.5 six, Creedmoor is going to take over. It is the new perfect intermediate round where 40, I think, was the worst intermediate between 9 and 45. <laughs> I think 6.5 Creedmoor is the perfect intermediate between 2.23 and 3.08. So much so now that even though I've been the longest holdout for 3.08, I wouldn't buy a new gun in 3.08 anymore. Hmm. Interesting. Everything in Africa with a 6.5 Creedmoor. And on paper, it loses for hunting, and it just destroyed everything. I have pictures on my Instagram of my wildebeest that everyone was just blown away at the thing essentially dropped and died with a little 6.5 Creedmoor. It, it's, it's, it's the way. Good to know. Good to know. All right. The uh, the six five Creedmoor here to stay going to be in belt fed machine guns. That's how you know. As far as uh, you know, something you just mentioned briefly, the super long barrels on the uh, the Valkyries. Do you have like a a rule of thumb as far as uh, barrel length for the um, the type of guns that you use for you know precision shooting or three gun? Yes, as short as possible. Okay. And is there a diminishing return? Because we can now talk absolutely, about like absolutely. So here. if I want six five Creedmoor, I want it because of its long range performance. Okay, right. So shooting six five Creedmoor out of a four inch barrel, so I get a giant fireball and the bullet doesn't get up to speed. Okay, that's stupid. So that's that's not as short as possible. That's shorter than possible, right? <laughs> um, like for a three oh eight, I think a perfect barrel length is eighteen inches. Okay, I love an eighteen inch three oh eight for a target long range shooting gun. My all those NSSF videos you see me with my 700 and 308 in those videos. That's mm -hmm. an 18 inch barreled gun. Uh, shorter barrels are more accurate than longer barrels. And we need a context for short barrels because I've heard this as well, and I've seen guys head to like 14 and a half inch barrels for uh, for three gun. Uh, I personally use an 18 inch barrel, which you know in the precision community would be considered short, but that's considered long in three I gun. Think 16 or 18 inches for a 223 is about perfect. Because I want that heavier bullet to get up to speed to do its job. Right. And I'm not too worried about maneuverability. Now, back in the military, and I got to get in and out of a vehicle or in and out of a building or stuff like that. Okay, maybe I want shorter. Uh, I think 223 suffers with short barrels because it needs to get up to velocity to do its job. A slow moving 223 bullet is just about useless in competition or in real life. Right. The only thing that bullet has going for it is its velocity. We're 308. I don't mind shedding some of that velocity because I'm still throwing a big rock down range. Right. Right. So I think 18, maybe 20 inches is perfect sweet spot for 308, even though your bullet will be slower than if you had a 24 inch barrel. I think it's worth it. Uh, 65 Creedmoor, I think 20 is a little shorter than I'd like. You know, maybe for three gun, I do a 20 inch barrel because who cares? I want some maneuverability. Um, but it really shines in like a 22 inch barrel or maybe a 24 inch barrel is a target gun. I guess it really depends on the use too. I bet people ask you all the time. You know, what gun should I get? Oh, totally. All I don't time. know. What car should I get? Yeah. Like you need to know I, I the use that. first, right? If I if I'm gonna need to haul lumber, I should probably get a pickup truck. But if I want gas mileage, maybe I should get a Prius. And by the way, both of those vehicles suck at each other's jobs. <laughs> so if if I what gun should I get? I don't know. What do you want? I want to shoot long range precision rifle, get a six five creed more with a twenty two, twenty four inch barrel. You know, I want to shoot three gun, get yourself a two two three. So it all depends.
Perfect. All right, Ryan. Well, just a couple more questions here. Where yep. where do you see the uh, the industry as a whole right now? If you, I mean, you're kind of on on the inside from the perspective mm -hmm. of you used to work at some of the bigger companies. Now you're in like more of a consulting role. We're in like mm -hmm. an interesting time. What do you see as the uh, the state of the firearms industry in general? Uh, we're getting. I think we're going to have more gun laws. I think we're going to lose some of our rights. I'm not excited about that. I just think uh, there's going to be another school shooting. That's a safe bet. There's sick people out there. And we're not doing anything appreciably to make things safer. I think that obviously more guns means less crime, but not everyone agrees with me. I think we're going to have more people making emotional decisions and try to force more gun laws. And even though I think uh, President Trump has done amazing things to keep you know winning on tons of stuff, he doesn't quite seem to get I think fundamental civil liberties on guns. So uh, even at the national level, if we keep winning, I think we're going to lose in the state level. And I tell people that too. Stop thinking, oh, Trump's here. We'll be fine. Uh, he's done nothing to stop California from banning straws because yeah. he can't. That's not his job. Even if he wanted to, he couldn't stop them from doing that. So I think the real risk for our gun rights is the local levels. That's going to happen. Uh, I think polymer cased ammo is really going to take off. I think that's the the new future. I think making cartridges out of brass is silly. I mean, we essentially still have the same cartridges that cowboys used. Yep. A brass cartridge with a primer with some gunpowder and a piece of lead flying out the front. All these advancements in the cartridge is the same. I think polymer cases is really the way to go. Uh, it'll be cheaper. It'll be more accurate because uh, you can have better case capacity, you know, more consistency there. You'll have less heating up and stuff for the chamber. So I think that's where we'll go there. Hmm. hmm. All right. Yeah. I mean, that sounds interesting. Uh, I'm ready for cheaper and more accurate though. Have you looked at polymer cases at all? I haven't. I didn't even know it was like an actual thing that's uh, being sold now. I, uh, well, it's I've not heard. being sold. The technology is being developed. They're figuring it out. It's, it makes it lighter too. So you're thinking military context. Yeah. You don't have corrosion of the case now. You don't have the weight. You don't have all those problems because it's plastic. And, and correct me if I'm wrong, but that's like one of the reasons for moving from the 30 odd six or the 308 cartridge to 223, right? Because you can carry Absolutely. more rounds with you. Yep. Well, uh, soldiers, uh, as a uh, law of averages, you know, combat is full of misses. Mm -hmm. So you have a low hit percentage. So you want to get more bad guys, you got to give them more chances to shoot. Right. right. So that's why they wanted lighter ammo for sure. So you lighten soldiers' load, you lighten people's, you know, load they're carrying around. That's one good thing. You get rid of the corrosion problem. That's another good thing. You get rid of hot brass being shot out at people. That's, That's nice. another good. I've got right? all kinds of great burn marks on my right arm. Right. From that. You have that right now you're looking for accuracy. You can get that internal case capacity perfect every single time versus brass, which can change a little bit. Now they're trying to figure out reloading. They're trying to figure out how that's going to work. But yeah, that's the way of the future. Well, if it's uh, if it promises everything you need to, why would you need to reload? True, but because you're still going to buy inaccurately loaded ammo. So I don't, uh, I'm, not, yeah. I'm not mad at manufacturers when they don't make accurate ammo. It's it, Every manufacturer out there could make something accurate. It's just what you're willing to pay for. Right. So you can go buy a plinking 223. It's not going to be accurate, even if it's got a polymer case. Right. Yeah, it could be. Point. Yeah. All right. So let's talk about the uh, the shooting sports then. Uh, where do you see the uh, shooting sports headed and, and what sort of role do you see that playing in like the uh, the political environment? Uh, more kids and more women. I think that's awesome. I think three guns, one of those sports that I think can really open up to them uh, because it's like, said so family friendly and the stage is, even though you're competing against other people, you're kind of competing against yourself. Mm -hmm. You know, I love sports, shooting sports in general, but especially things like three gun in that it's one of the playing fields where men and women really can be on the same level. Mm -hmm. You know, they'll still have men's women's divisions. I don't always know why they do that. Because it's usually not a strength issue, you know, for the difference. Right. Um, so I think that's what's going to happen. And I think that'll help in culture when you see more kids doing it and more women doing it. And it's, you know, a bunch of less uh, old white dudes with, with guts like me. <laughs> you know, that, that, that's the face of the industry. I don't know what's going to happen to the NRA. I don't, I don't know if the NRA is long for this world. I mm, think we're really. Probably, yeah. Yeah. What, why is that, Ryan? Financial troubles right now, uh, political troubles. You know, we're, we're getting mainstream articles. There's an uh, article in Reuters this morning um, talking about how the NRA is losing its base. You know, how the NRA doesn't necessarily appeal as much to you and me as they do to what I would call like gun 1.0. You know, they definitely don't appeal to me because they don't 
they don't back anything that I that I love and appreciate about the uh, the Second Amendment. It seems yep. like they're more willing to have concessions in like a British Australian sort of model exactly of right. so only the uh, the they're rich losing their guns. base. They're losing the base. They're appealing to the wrong people. They're having financial trouble. So I wouldn't be surprised if they're not long for this world. The problem is we as an industry need to recognize that now and start coming up with something that does mm -hmm. or else we're going to have a little bit of a vacuum when they're gone and not have the next thing ready and lose some ground. Well, and then we're, you know, if we, as, as much as, you know, I like to give the NRA a hard time, they are the reason that we're, you know, still able to have a voice because there's several million members. Of is, course. Is the next best thing like the NSSF or GOA or is there a next best thing? Uh, it's probably not the NSSF. So the NSSF and the NRA uh, divide each other's roles at the cash register. So the NSSF is the industry. So they work for the you know the retailer, the distributors, the manufacturers. But at the point of the sale, the NRA is really the advocate of the consumer, of the mm -hmm. end user, right? Um, and so maybe GOA consumer. Does it need to be a consumer or end user group that that stands for our rights, or can it be from a a manufacturer standpoint? Uh, it can be from a manufacturer standpoint, and the NSSF does fight for it, which is what I helped do when I was there. And Larry Keen, who runs that, is just an amazing man, and I consider him a mentor and someone I look up to, to to run these fights for us. But they run it from the industry angle. They run it from the numbers and jobs impacts and things like that. Um, some manufacturers, we've seen this in our industry, don't stand up for our rights. Some manufacturers don't mind that you have to buy another product from them. You know, it's sad to say that, but it happens sometimes. So I am scared for our industry. I know I might be alone in that. I think a lot of people are feeling very comfortable right now, but I'm nervous because everybody else is comfortable right now. Right. So, yeah, it's, it's that uh, whole, I don't know. It. Yeah, it's like the investment thing, you know? It's, uh, um, what the heck is that guy's name? Dude that lives in Omaha. I always forget. Berkshire Hathaway, come on. He Warren says Buffett. That, Warren Buffett, thank you. Mm -hmm. He says that when the uh when the market is is uh panic is in a panic and everyone's selling, you should be buying and vice of course. versa, right? So yeah. yeah, I mean what you're what you're saying there does make sense. Yeah, everyone's comfortable right now. I'm like, oh have you guys noticed some of the things that President Trump tweets? He's not exactly the uh the term that Reuters used in the article this morning was a gun mentalist, which I thought was kind of cool. <laughs> Talking about people that are like so fundamentalist for guns that they're mad at the NRA for not being tough enough. Yeah. You know, how they're kind of branching away from it. Um he and some of the administration seem like they'd be willing to concede some gun rights in exchange for other things. Right. You know? Um and that scares me. Yeah, absolutely. And it, it's like the uh the bump the bump fire stock thing. You know, like I, I don't own a bump fire stock. I think they're stupid. Uh mm -hmm. but and I'm sad that that's the hill that we have to defend, but it's it is something you know two A related that we have to stop because then they're going to come after my hyperfire or my Timney or my well exactly right. Like if that. you don't, no one's going to be there for you when they come after the stuff you like. Yeah. Um, also, it comes down to the question on why are we trying to infringe on the rights? I know the Second Amendment says shall not be infringed, but like it or not, current interpretation of how our constitutional law system works is you can have infringements on our civil rights. They just have to be uh, narrowly tailored and be the least restrictive means possible to achieve the end. Uh, we need to win the argument of banning the guns won't do what you want it to do. Like if someone wants to have a discussion to ban bump stocks for whatever reason, okay, let's have the discussion. I don't think we should shut the conversation down. I think we should have the discussion. Because by the way, we hate it when they the other side shuts conversations down with us. We should have the discussion. Maybe you'll educate them. And if it's for a reason that eventually makes sense, I don't know what that reason would be, maybe I'd be for it. But if their reason is to stop crime or to prevent you know, uh, crimes from happening with guns, okay, now I'm definitely against it because that's not going to work. And that's where we should be against gun laws when they do that is say, hey guys, banning bump stocks is not going to work any more than banning shootings did. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, murder is already illegal. It's something we repeat a lot. Right, in so the, we shouldn't. Uh, we shouldn't focus i don't think necessarily on the 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 uh band du jour but instead just focus on hold on stop more gun rigs won't work so why are we discussing a gun rig so that's why i want something like a mayday safety or something else where you can say you know that's not going to work stop that here is something that's going to work and then i can beat them over the head when they don't do it then when they say no we're still banning bump stocks i can say aha you're just trying to ban guns don't you dare say it's a solution because i'm giving i'm gift wrapping a solution for you and you're not taking it so that's how i like that strategy too
Awesome. And that means we've uh, we've come full circle. We got to call back to the first 10 minutes of the show. So, Ryan, one final thought or one piece of advice for the uh, audience, something that they can take away from our discussion today. Stop worrying about being too precise. Enjoy an acceptable amount of accuracy and practice doing that. I love it. Ryan, this has been awesome, man. I really do appreciate your time that you've given up for the uh, the Three Gun Show audience today and for joining me here. Thanks, man. Thanks for having me on, Dave. I appreciate it.